Um, okay, so I think it's time now to um, introduce our speaker for today. Um, it's for me a pleasure to introduce all of you, um, Olivia Balbin. Um, Olivia leads the molecular neurodegeneration research line within the um, group of Dr. Alberto Yeo at the San Paulo Research Institute in Barcelona. She completed her PhD on genetic risk factors for Alzheimer's disease at the University of Nottingham in 2007, and later spent three years as a postdoctoral researcher in the group of um, Stephen Junking at the Mayo Clinic, where she first turned her focus toward genetic and molecular factors underlying AD-related synapse degeneration. In 2011, um, she got uh, she was uh, financed by the Juan de la Sierva and later Miguel Cervet fellowships, um, and she relocated to the group of Alberto Yeo. Then in 2014, uh, Olivia be began her own research line focused on the development of biofluid markers of synapse degeneration to aid the diagnosis and management of patients with neurodegenerative diseases. And um, the title of uh, her talk uh, today is exactly that, uh, it's Biofluid Markers of Synapse Degeneration in Neurodegenerative Diseases. I would like to uh, welcome Olivia and thank her for her willingness to share with us her work and um, Olivia, uh, thank you very much. And please, you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the introduction and, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak in this forum. I'm, I'm really looking forward to sharing our data with you. I confirm that you can see the slides, I hope. Uh, if not, please let me know. They should be uh, available now. So as I said, I'm gonna talk about biofluid markers of synapse degeneration in neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, as I've already been introduced, I'll, I'll get straight in. Uh, and uh, uh, just explain a little bit the presentation outline. So first I'm gonna talk about why we need synaptic biomarkers. Uh, and then the bulk of the talk will be about how we discovered uh, the panel that I'm gonna to explain to you and, and some of the clinical and neuropathological studies we've done of this panel of synaptic biomarkers across neurodegenerative diseases and give some overall conclusions. So I'm sure you're all aware uh, there is a lot of evidence uh, that neurodegenerative diseases are synaptic failures. There is a lot of literature on this. And basically the conclusion is, is that uh, synapse degeneration occurs early in these diseases and is prior to neurodegeneration. Uh, this is true of Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, uh, um, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Huntington's disease, multiple sclerosis, and many more. And just a note for maybe for, for later in the talk, I will mention this, uh, synapses are also affected in psychiatric disorders such as uh, schizophrenia uh, and autism, among others. So this could also, uh, uh, they, these diseases could also benefit from a synaptic biomarker. So why, why would we want a synaptic biomarker? What, what would the potential use be? Well, um, first of all, uh, as, you, as you know, synapse degeneration is the best correlate of cognitive uh, decline. Okay, so it is possible that if you can measure the amount of synapse degeneration uh, in a patient, then you, uh, it will be a, a more, uh, um, an objective measure of cognitive decline. There's also a possibility that a synaptic biomarker, if you can measure specific synapse populations that are lost, that they could uh, correlate well with different neuropathologies, and that you could, they could help with disease subtyping and differential diagnoses. It's also possible that they could be used as a measure of disease progression and therefore could help uh, identify patients who would benefit from recruitment into clinical trials. And specifically in clinical trials, uh, uh, synaptic markers could be very useful as there is a need for markers that are not uh, part of the, the drug target. So many uh, clinical trials, as mentioned here, this is taken from Alts Forum, uh, uh, are targeting uh, the pathological protein in each disease. And these pathological proteins are known to affect the synapse. So you cannot use um, the same biomarker, diagnostic biomarker used as the target of the drug to measure the, the drug efficacy. You need an independent marker. So that's where synaptic biomarkers could be particularly useful. So um, in terms of how you measure synapse degeneration, obviously there are neuroimaging techniques, but they are precluded in, in many hospitals and many patients. So the obvious option was to turn to the cerebral spinal fluid. And CSF markers are routine in Alzheimer's disease, um, but there is no as yet uh, defined synaptic biomarker in CSF. 
what we do have in Alzheimer's disease are markers of amyloidosis and of tau-mediated uh, tau neurodegeneration. This is CSFA beta-42, CSF-tau, and phospho-tau. And these are great, excellent diagnostic biomarkers, uh, and it's unlikely that any other biomarker will improve upon the diagnostic capacity of these uh, biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease. However, it must be said that there are no positive diagnostic biomarkers for other neurodegenerative diseases. And as I mentioned, there is as yet no established uh, marker of synaptic failure. So with this in mind, back in 2014, we started this project uh, and the idea was to discover and validate uh, a new panel of, of synaptic proteins that could be used as a potential measure of synapse degeneration in the brain. We focus principally on Alzheimer's disease. This is a very well characterized study, but it could be applied to many neurodegenerative diseases. And I will give evidence this is the case uh, later in the talk. So uh, in order to identify uh, potentially new synaptic biomarkers, we came up with a three-step process. And the first in the discovery, uh, we performed shotgun proteomics of the CSF proteome and also literature curation uh, to identify synaptic proteins. I will go into more detail of each step later, but this is just the grand overview. So once we identified synaptic proteins that are detectable in the CSF, we wanted to validate a set of those for really being synaptic specific. And so we used two technologies. Again, I will go more detail into these technologies later, but they are array tomography, microscopy, and also biochemical fractionation of the synaptic cell. And then uh, we developed a targeted mass spectrometry approach for a panel of synaptic proteins that we could then use in exploratory and validation cohorts in AD. Uh, and, and I will now go into uh, each step of the process. So for the discovery stage, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, we perform shotgun proteomics of CSF. Uh, these we use seven pools of 10 patients in each pool, uh, and these were both control and AD patients. And we first depleted uh, the uh, abundant proteins, which are the immunoglobulins and albumins, as we, they were not of interest to us, and they can uh, create noise at the, at the level of identifying proteins and, and reduce to reduce the complexity of the sample. This can help for very much. So we then uh, subjected the depleted samples to digestion with uh, lysine and trypsine. Uh, we perform fractionation to further simplify the sample. Uh, and then we subjected the samples to uh, liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. And in a total, we identified across all of the pools, a total of 2,742 proteins that are detectable by mass spectrometry in the CSF. So we wanted to complement this uh, with other proteins that we may have missed uh, from the literature. So we did a, a search of PubMed for all studies of the CSF proteome. And we found 10 studies that fit the criteria of being cognitively or neurologically uh, normal. Uh, and a proteomic screen. Uh, we has extracted the proteins where possible that were published in those proteins, which was a total of 3,662. And we combined them with, with our list of nearly 3,000. In total, we now had a, a combined number of 4,315 proteins that are detectable in CSF. So now we know what's in the CSF, we would like to restrict those to those that are specific to the synapse. To do this, um, we did a curation of the literature and databases. So first of all, we had two criteria. We defined a synaptic protein as having a known synaptic function and also present in synapse-enriched fractions from rodent or human brain tissue. To define the proteins that have a synaptic function, we use three databases. This is gene ontology, uh, the KEG, or Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes, and the Uniprot database. And we searched for all proteins that were annotated uh, with the following, uh, or the, the, the terms used on the left in gray, uh, dendritic spine, synapse, synaptic transmission of nerve impulse, etc. We tried to be as inclusive as possible, but uh, as specifically synaptic. Uh, using those criteria, we identified a total of 915 proteins. The second criteria is that they had to be present in synapse-enriched fraction, fractions uh, from rodent or human brain tissue. So we searched the literature and we found uh, these studies that had performed uh, proteomic studies uh, in either mat, mouse, rat, or human brain tissue, and specifically in biochemical fractionations of either the synaptosome, synaptic vesicle, or the postsynaptic density. And each, uh, we extracted the proteins from each paper, and we, uh, we found a list of about 2,000, of, of exactly 2,859 proteins. When we then combined, we looked for proteins that were present in both lists, so have a synaptic function and were in the synaptic fractions, we uh, ended up uh, with a total of over 500 proteins. 
So now we had defined the, the CSF proteome and the synaptic proteome. We wanted to f identify uh, where the two databases merge. We merged the two um, and we found a total of um, uh, 255 synaptic proteins that were present in the CSF and also have a synaptic function and also uh, known to be in, in, in synaptic fractions. So just of note here, uh, you can see that our, our definition of the CSF proteome represents about 26% of the brain proteome. Uh, this we estimated using the human brain at, uh, protein atlas, using the RNA brain expression. So uh, this shows that about a quarter of the proteins that are known in, to be expressed in the brain were present in, in the CSF of these proteomic studies. In contrast, the synaptic proteome uh, represented a lot uh, fewer, just 4% of the brain proteome, but this is to be expected, this is a specific subfraction. And of uh, the proteins um, in the CSF, we were actually, we were quite surprised with the high number. We, we identified about 47% of our synaptic proteome detectable in the CSF. So, uh, this was a large number of proteins. We, we selected a subset of them and we wanted to really identify uh, or determine, validate the specificity of each protein to the synapse. So the first method we used for this is biochemical fractionation. So we took uh, frozen cortical tissue from six non-neurodegenerative uh, controls. We uh, homogenized the sample. We kept part of the homogenate back and the rest we uh, subjected to uh, ultracentrifugation over a sucrose gradient. And what you can then do is take uh, the band representing the synaptosome and you can purify that. If you then add tri uh, Triton X detergent to, to this sample, you can also further purify it to the postsynaptic proteins. So now we have a homogenate, we have synaptosome, which is the global synapse, uh, and also the postsynaptic density. And we can subject these samples to uh, SDS page uh, and uh, immunostain for uh, synaptic proteins to see how much enrichment we have of the proteins uh, in, each, uh, in each fraction. So here are our results. This is our selected panel that we chose from our 255 synaptic proteins that were in CSF. We selected 10 uh, to validate. This does not include the two marked here, this is synaptophysin and PSD95. We included as reference controls of a presynaptic and a postsynaptic protein. Unfortunately, they were not detected in the CSF, so we could not use them in our panel. And here you can see the, the Western blot band for each uh, protein of each of our candidate synaptic proteins in the homogenous synaptosome and in the PSD. And then we calculated the enrichment of each protein in either the synaptosome compared to the homogenate, S over H, or the postsynaptic density over the homogenate, or PSD over H. And you can see, uh, for example, with the reference markers, synaptophysin was very enriched, about nearly fourfold enriched in the synaptosome, uh, but not in the postsynaptic density. This would be expected for a presynaptic protein. And PSD95 uh, was uh, enriched particularly in, in the postsynaptic fraction. If you compare, our candidate proteins were all significantly enriched in either the whole synaptosome or in the postsynaptic density. So this was promising that their expression is more abundant in synapse than in the total homogenate, which is a sign that they are specifically expressed to a certain degree in the synapse. But we want to do a little further than this and understand really their localization at the synapse. So for this, we use a different technique, uh, which is a ray tomography microscopy. You may be familiar with this technique, but for those who are not, uh, the idea of a ray tomography microscopy is that it's a way of um, uh, getting over the resolution limit of traditional microscopy. So uh, just to demonstrate here on the left, you can see the resolution of, of a traditional light microscope is about 200 nanometers. So if you have uh, a protein one in red and a protein two in green, and they are close at the distance of, of a typical synapse, then they would actually be seen uh, as one specific spot in yellow shown here. However, if you can uh, introduce a physical confocality to your sample by cutting ultra thin sections that are below this limit, so 70 nanometers, uh, you can uh, distance these samples physically and your moon is stain and you will see the pre and the post synapse uh, uh, in, in a separate image, for example. So uh, we applied this technique. We took a J, uh, blocks of, of tissue frozen, uh, fresh brain tissue. Uh, we, sub uh, we put it into a hard resin, LR white, this makes hardens the sample so that you could then use an ultra microtome to cut ultra thin sections, about 70 nanometers each. So this ribbon, uh, you can then immunostain as you would normally for any typical immunofluorescence with as many channels as your microscope allows. And then you can reconstruct the ribbon into uh, one image as shown here. 
And what it allows you to do is to analyze thousands of sample uh, synapses, but at the single synapse level. So we would uh, immunostain uh, our samples with synaptophysin, a presynaptic marker, and PSD95, a postsynaptic marker, and each of our candidate synaptic proteins in blue. And here are our results. So on the left in each case, you can see the 3D reconstruction, and on the right, you can see uh, the immunostaining in each ribbon. And the, um, the scale bar it represents one micron. Okay, so as all, in all of the images, green is presynapse, uh, red is postsynapse, and blue is our candidate marker. Now, in all but one of our cases, uh, we found that the blue of the synaptic candidate marker uh, co-localized uh, co with either or both the, the synaptic marker. So you can see that the blue is touching in all of the cases with the exception of tenastin R, okay? So here you can see that at increased resolution, although it is close to the synapse, it is not actually part of the synapse. And you can see very clearly here in the reconstruction that it is uh, slightly apart. Now, tenestin R is a perineuronal net protein, and so it makes sense that this is not specific to the synapse, rather it surrounds the synapse. So using this technique, we excluded tenestin R uh, as not being a, a truly synaptic partane, and we continued with the other nine synaptic proteins. So to give you a summary of what these proteins are, they're shown in the white circles, each of our, uh, our selected proteins, and this is the known synaptic interactome uh, of each protein, so other synaptic proteins that they are known to interact with uh, according to online databases. And you can see that they uh, are, um, co uh, are interact with a variety of proteins involved in synapse assembly and organization, spine maintenance or plasticity, synaptic transmission, and also synaptic vesicle recycling. So in order to quantify these proteins in CSF, we wanted to set up a targeted mass spectrometry panel. So targeted mass spectrometry or selected reaction monitoring, also known as multiple reaction monitoring, allows you to measure multiple peptides in the, and simultaneously in the same sample. Um, so what we did was we, we, we looked at the sequence of, of these nine proteins and we selected sequences that were detected in our CSF uh, uh, pool by shotgun microscopy, uh, shotgun mass spectrometry, uh, and we selected the most, um, most abundant uh, peptides, up to three, uh, and we then uh, subject these to multiple or selected reaction monitoring. Uh, we, uh, we synthesized the synthetic peptides uh, that were... Uh, that have um, uh, heavy uh, isotopes uh, so that we can use those as reference uh, in the in later sample. Uh, we digested the sample with lysine and trypsine and subjected to uh, an LC gradient and used uh, mass spectrometry. And so when you quantify the endogenous levels of your protein, you, you express it relative to the reference peptides. So we were able to do this in the three cohorts uh, of clinical Alzheimer's disease and controls. Uh, this was in collaboration with uh, the Theta Foundation and, uh, and Hospital Clinic, Raquel Sanchez and Pablo Martinez Laje. So through, and also we used the SPIN cohort here in Barcelona. So with these three cohorts, we were able to get um, uh, a large sample size, including cognitively normal controls. What we define as stage one of AD, this is defined as cognitively normal, amyloid positive based on CSF biomarkers, neurodegeneration negative. Stage two is defined as a cognitively normal amyloid and, and tau marker positive. Prodromal AD is defined as AD biomarker positive, so both amyloidosis and neurodegeneration and with mild cognitive impairment. And AD dementia is defined as the same, but instead of mild cognitive impairment uh, with actual dementia. So using our mass spectrometry approach, we first used our uh, samples from SPIN and CETER, uh, and we, uh, we, we quantified these proteins across each disease stage. Here you can see each color is a different protein, each line is a different peptide from that protein, and they're all expressed relative to controls. And what you can see um, in the dotted line means it wasn't significant uh, when adjusting for multiple testing. But what you can see is a clear increase in, in most of the synaptic proteins, particularly in the prodromal stage and in some cases at the dementia stage. We did see a trend for a decrease in the preclinical stage one, but it was not significant. So we went to a second cohort, and these were samples from uh, Raquel Sanchez in Hospital Clinic using the same criteria and the same method. Uh, and what we found was a similar profile, albeit that now we found significance in stage one uh, and a trend only uh, at the later disease stages. 
So we were very intrigued by this, these changes in the pre first preclinical stage, because remember, these are cognitively normal subjects uh, who are positive for amyloid biomarkers in CSF. So we found uh, more uh, cognitively normal uh, amyloid positive uh, subjects from our cohort. These were different independent samples. Uh, and we, we, we performed a follow-up study and we replicated in most cases the, this reduction. Uh, so a lower in stage one compared to cognitively normal controls. We then did a meta-analysis of all of the data, and what we found then was that we do have a significant decrease across all cohorts uh, in, this, in the preclinical stage, and a, an, an, a relative increase uh, at later disease stages. This is a very intriguing finding, and for sure it absolutely needs um, follow-up in other cohorts. I will provide some uh, further evidence for this, but uh, we're working on uh, further follow-up studies. Uh, how we interpret this? Um, well, it, it's difficult to know, and, and again, I will show you more evidence of, uh, of how we're, we're trying to work this out. Um, but we wonder whether the, the reduction in stage one could be a response to amyloidosis. Maybe there is a reduced synapse density in these people. Maybe there is a sequestration of the synaptic protein, maybe in, in the pathological lesions, or perhaps even internalization of the synapse. Uh, and then the later, di uh, the later disease stages, this increase, whether we, it seems to be an increased clearance of the synaptic proteins into the CSF, whether this is specific to the synapse degeneration or even later neurodegeneration is uh, as yet unclear. So uh, we wanted to follow this up, uh, particularly we were interested in, in preclinical AD. Um, and so we turned to another cohort that we have here at San Paolo, which is the Dabney cohort, which is of adults with Down syndrome. Now, why is the Down syndrome interesting uh, in Alzheimer's disease? Well, as you can see here, what we published in Lancet Neurology, here you have age of uh, adults with Down syndrome and the prevalence of dementia, AD dementia, in, in this cohort. And what you can see is there is an uh, increase in prevalence of dementia with age, and such that by the, uh, the sixth decade of life, uh, almost 90% of adults with Down syndrome have uh, AD dementia. So what this means is uh, these uh, people with Down syndrome are gene maybe genetically predisposed due to trisomy of chromosome 21 to developing Alzheimer's disease, and it's uh, another genetic form of AD. So uh, we took uh, from our uh, cohort, we took 20 controls, and we took uh, Down syndrome divided into three groups. First of all, those who were asymptomatic, they showed no signs of cognitive impairment. Those who showed signs of um, mild cognitive impairment, these are called prodromal AD and those with dementia. And we measured the same synaptic proteins, uh, the full panel by the same mass spectrometry method. And what we found when we compared across all synaptic proteins, and we also included another synaptic protein here, NPTX2, when we compared the correlation of these proteins, synaptic proteins with cognitive impairment in adults with Down syndrome, syna uh, VAMP2 was actually the best synaptic correlate of cognitive impairment. OK, so here you can see this is mild uh, cued recall, uh, sorry, the modified cued recall test for Down syndrome. This is a measure of episodic memory in um, immediate and delayed recall and the CAMCOG test, which is a test of global uh, cognition. We saw a significant association of AMP2 with the episodic memory, the cued recall test, and it was not significant uh, in CAMCOG, although when you adjust for in intellectual uh, impairment, it, it, it was significant. So VAMP2 was the synaptic protein that best correlated with uh, episodic memory, which is the, uh, a sign of Alzheimer's uh, disease. We wanted to validate that this was not due to intellectual disability, so we quantified the um, VAMP2 uh, according to and divided the patient, uh, the, the subject according to whether they had mild, moderate, or severe and profound intellectual disability, and we found no change. So we concluded that VAMP, CSF VAMP2 levels um, were associated with cognitive impairment, but not intellectual uh, in impairment. So then we, we compared uh, the levels of VAMP2 across the, the different uh, groups, uh, as I said, asymptomatic prodromal and dementia due to AD. And similar to the sporadic AD, we found a decrease uh, in the asymptomatic group compared to cognitively non-trisomic controls and a later increase uh, over later disease stages. And this is also seen very nicely with age. So uh, as, as people with Down syndrome uh, grow older, the, the prevalence of, of, of AD dementia is higher. And what we can see here is the levels of VAMP2 were also increasing with age uh, in the Down syndrome, uh, which is shown in red and, and was not significant in, in the controls. Um, 
We also found that they correlated very well with AV biomarkers. So this is the CSFA beta 42 to 40 ratio, phosphor tau and neurofilament light, um, uh, and the, the VAM2 on the y-axis. And you can see strong correlation with AD. So we concluded here that uh, this was validation of what we saw in sporadic AD. We see a very similar profile over the course of AD in Down syndrome, and that the changes are in fact related to AD itself and not to intellectual disability or, or trisomy 21. So uh, we um, wanted to follow up on these findings with VAMP2. Um, and up to now, we've been dependent on using mass spectrometry techniques, which are very expensive. Uh, so we decided to develop uh, a, a, an immunoassay for VAMP2. We did this uh, in collaboration with ADX Neurosciences, um, led by Eugene van Michelen in, in Belgium. And they developed to us a SEMOA or a digital ELISA. This is ultra sensitive ELISA uh, that uh, allows detection in, in low quantities. They used a commercial antibody uh, from cell signaling and also uh, developed our own in house uh, antibody. And what we found was that this, this SEMOA assay can detect uh, VAMP2 in CSF across a full range of, of concentrations. It was very reproducible with low coefficients of variation. So this enabled us to look at VAMP2 across a larger cohort, because we're now not restricted so much to the cost of the mass spectrometry. So we wanted to see if we found the same thing in our sporadic AD cohort uh, in a larger group. So again, we have the same uh, classifications in sporadic AD, so cognitively normal controls, stage one, stage two, prodromal and dementia. And we found exactly the same profile that we saw with mass spectrometry. So reduction at stage one compared to controls and a later increase. It's also significant at the later disease stages compared to controls if you do not uh, adjust for age. So these are including age in the model. Uh, also, like in Down syndrome, we found a significant association of CSF VAMP2 with acute recall tests, so a, a, a measure of episodic memory. So we wanted to understand a bit more about why VAMP2 may be, um, may be changing in CSF. So we wanted to perform a neuropathologic study. For this, we selected samples from the, the neurological tissue bank at, at, in hospital clinic. We selected 10 uh, controls without neuropathological lesions, uh, shown here uh, in the blue. And in the red, we selected two, uh, 10 AD patients. These are uh, a late stage AD. Um, and we first performed immunohistochemistry using a VAMP2 anti antibody. And we, uh, we performed it in four different brain regions. This was the CA1 of the hippocampus, frontal cortex, uh, the singular cortex, and the inferior temporal cortex. And here you can see the, uh, the gray matter at the top and the white uh, uh, matter at the bottom. And what you can see, first of all, is that VAMP2 is largely specific to the gray matter. This is consistent with it being a synaptic protein. It is, has a very uh, punctate uh, a staining, uh, again, consistent with it being uh, synaptic. It's not in the soma. You can see very clearly that it's not in the cell bodies. We then performed immunofluorescence with some other cell markers, GF GFAP and magenta, MAP2 uh, of neurons in, in red, uh, VAMP2 in green, and DAPI, the nuclei stained in red. And what you can see is it is not in the cell bodies of either neurons or, or astrocytes, but rather it shows a punctate neuropil like uh, expression outside, uh, which is consistent with it being at the synapse. We then quantified its expression in the gray matter of the four brain regions in the ADs and controls. And we found a trend towards a decrease uh, in AD compared to controls in all regions, but a specific decrease in the hippocampus. So this was very promising, as, as I said, it, it, the CSF levels of this protein correlate with episodic memory. Episodic memory is, is believed to uh, be a sign of damage of the hippocampus. So the fact that we saw a specific reduction in the hippocampus of AD patients of AMP2 uh, was very, indeed very promising. So uh, we wanted to continue more with, the, with, this, uh, with this protein, and we wanted to look in, in dementia with Lewy bodies. Dementia with Lewy bodies is another common form of uh, neurodegenerative uh, disease, uh, of which also has a large component of co AD comorbidity. So um, in our SPIN cohort, uh, we selected cognitively normal controls and DLB patients, uh, according to the diagnostic criteria, and AD patients. Now, the DLB patients, we then separated into those who have signs of AD comorbidity. To do this, we used our established cutoff that we have previously published, which is CSF phosphor tau to AB to 42 ratio. So individuals have a rate who have a ratio of greater than uh, 0.06 is a sign that they have AD, it's an AD biomarker. 
Okay, so DLB patients with uh, with ratios above this uh, could be believed to be have AV comorbidity, and the 19 patients that had ratio below this level are, are more likely to be pure DLB. So we quantified RAM2 using our SIMOA assay in these individuals, and we compared to the controls. And what we found was interesting. So first of all, we found a reduced. So here you can see the dotted line is the actual mean, and the red is the age-adjusted mean. And what you can see is that the age-adjusted mean is decreased in the pure DLB group compared to controls. But the, the group with uh, DLB and AD uh, biomarkers was elevated compared to controls to levels very similar uh, to those in the AD group. Uh, so this uh, shows that maybe potentially there is different mechanisms at play in individuals in, in terms of VAMP2 in individuals who have AD uh, biomarkers and those who do not. We performed receiver operating characteristics to see if we can uh, how, how good VAMP2 was at distinguishing different uh, pairwise combinations. And we found it had very good uh, accuracy, so uh, an area under the curve of 80% to distinguish the, the, the pure DLB from the DLB and AD. Um, the diagnostic accuracy was decreased in, in, other, in other combinations, uh, but this could be a sign that it's another way of identifying individuals uh, with AD comorbidity. So we wanted to understand a bit more what, what is making these CSF changes. Uh, uh, so we performed a linear regression, uh, including multiple variables in the model to see which was the, the best predictor of the outcome of CSF VAM2. We, we put in the model uh, phosphatau, a beta 42 to 40, a diagnosis of DLD, age, neurofilament light, APOE4 status, and sex. And we found that almost 70% of VAMP2 levels in CSF can be explained by phosphatau levels. And here on the right at the top, you can see the correlation of CSF phosphatau with VAMP2 in the DLB group. And there's a very strong correlation, not only in those who are positive for the AD biomarkers, but also in those who are negative. In contrast, we did not see a correlation with neurofilament light. So CSF uh, phosphatau is a marker of, of tau-mediated neurodegeneration, possibly of tau pathology. And CSF neurofilament light is a marker of axonal degeneration. So this is promising in that CSF M2 is not simply a marker of the neuronal degeneration, but should be specific uh, to synapse degeneration. So to summarize VAMP2, um, you can see that uh, we found that CSF VAMP2 shows a nonlinear profile across the AD continuum, and we showed this in both genetic and sporadic forms of AD. It correlates with AD biomarkers, particularly phosphatau, and it, can, uh, it could be used as a surrogate measure of episodic memory. In the brain, VAMP2 was selectively reduced in AD hippocampus. So we think that CSF VAMP2 seems to be uh, have high specificity uh, for people with AD biomarkers, so it's Alzheimer-specific uh, synapse degeneration. So to continue on, uh, we wanted then to look in other neurodegenerative diseases. Um, frontal temporal dementia is, is one such disease. And as you're aware, uh, frontal temporal dementia uh, shows a, a, there's a large uh, clinical heter heterogeneity. Uh, and also, there is not a clear correlation between the clinical syndrome and the neuropathological basis uh, of the disease, so the neuropathology underlying in the brain. Um, so what this means um, is that it's very difficult uh, clinically to understand which pathology is underlying in people who, who show uh, with, with FTLD-related uh, syndromes. The two most common pathologies in, in FTLD are, are tau and TDP. So we contacted some collaborators at the University of Pennsylvania who have uh, a cohort of anti-mortem CSF and post-mortem tissue from patients with FDLD tau, FDLD TDP, and Alzheimer's disease. And we, we measured our complete panel going back to the mass spectrometry uh, assay now so that we could measure the full panel. So here is the details of the cohort. As I mentioned, we have FDLD tau, TDP, AD, and, and controls. These have anti-mortem CSF and post-mortem brain tissue. And when we quantified the, the panel of nine synaptic proteins, what we found was, um, here we go with VAMP2, we can see that it was elevated in AD compared to controls, but was not um, uh, elevated in the FDLD groups. Neither, there was a trend, but it was not significant. However, we did find three synaptic proteins, calcintinin 1, nurexin 2A, and Thai 1, that were specifically reduced in FDLD TDP uh, compared to controls, okay? In all three cases, they were significantly reduced in FDLD T 
TDP compared to control. So we thought this was uh, interesting and we, we, we wanted to follow this up further. So we wanted to know whether they could predict the, the pathology uh, underlying uh, a postmortem. So here is a correlation of the antimortem uh, levels of these proteins in CSF with postmortem uh, post global TDP43 burden and global tau burden. So in the FDOD TDP group and in the tau group. And what we could see is that those same markers that were reduced in the FDD TDP group were correlated with uh, postmortem TDP43 burden, but not with tau. So this is consistent with the previous findings that they were more reduced in the TDP group and they could predict uh, the degree of TDP43 burden in the brain postmortem. This was at the individual protein level. Uh, none of these proteins uh, were correlated with minimental state examination, the MMSC cognitive impairment, but we tested whether a multi-marker model uh, could could predict uh, the cognitive impairment. We found several models that did, and I'm just going to show one of them here. This multi-marker model contained four of our synaptic uh, proteins. Um, in order to get to this, uh, let me go back a step. What we did was a stepwise linear regression with backward entry, and we forced uh, uh, education and age at death into the model, and we let the model decide um, which was the best variable out of all of the synaptic proteins. Um, uh, to predict the outcome measure, which was minimental state examination. So this was our best model. This was in the FDLD tau group. Uh, it was significant at the level of 0 0.04. Uh, we found that four of the synaptic proteins were found to be the best predictor in the model, of three of which were individually uh, significant. And here you can see the adjusted uh, correlation uh, of each individual marker adjusted for the others in the model. Uh, and their correlation uh, with minimental state examination on the y-axis. And you can see that the, the correlation is, is reasonably uh, good uh, and also in different directions, which is why maybe uh, the multi-marker model was better than an indi any individual protein alone. Now, this multi-marker model also uh, included VAMP2, which was the protein I was talking about earlier, which seems to be related with cognitive impairment in Alzheimer's disease. It includes calcintinin 1, which was one of the proteins that was reduced in the, in the TDP group and trended towards a reduction in the tau group, and glutamate receptor 4. This is a glutamatergic receptor. Um, this same multi-marker model uh, showed good diagnostic accuracy uh, to uh, distinguish between the two neuropathologic subtypes, so people with FDLD TDP and FDLD tau. The area under the curve was 83%. Here you can see the receiver operating characteristic for this model in black and each of the individual markers alone in each different color. And what you can see is that the, the, this was uh, a good uh, accuracy to, to, to distinguish these two neuropathologic subtypes. Uh, it showed less but relatively good accuracy at also distinguishing TDP from AD, TDP from controls, to a lesser extent tau from AD and, and tau from controls. But this is promising as this is the first uh, CSF biomarker, albeit a multi-marker panel, that can distinguish between these two neuropathological subtypes anti-mortem. So uh, to conclude from FDLD, CSF calcintinin 1 and neurexin 2A uh, have potential as surrogate markers of TD453 burden in FDLD. And a multi-marker CSF model predicted cognitive performance and showed good diagnostic accuracy to discriminate neuropathological subtypes. So uh, this is the end of my talk. I just want to, I hope I've shown you that uh, synaptic proteins may have a diverse range of, of uses in the clinical setting. Uh, we, we have seen that they could be potential surrogate measures of cognitive decline, uh, that they may detect early pathophysiological changes in preclinical uh, individuals, uh, that they may have use in disease subtyping. And it also seems clear that different synaptic proteins may have different uses in different diseases. But what I hope is that these may, uh, could be um, useful markers to be included in clinical trials as surrogate measure of cognitive performance that is independent of the drug target. So moving forward, we are continuing to try and validate these, these findings in, in independent cohorts. We are also trying to transfer it to plasma. So we have some working assays that can detect uh, VAMP2 at least in, in plasma. We'd like to see whether it, it works as a blood biomarker. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, there is also potential use uh, of these biomarkers in psychiatric disorders. So we are looking for collaborations uh, of people who may have samples from psychiatric or affective disorders. So thank you for your time. I think I went a little bit over, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, I, 
just before finishing, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the team where I work. So specifically, uh, Alba, Laya, and, and Raul, who, who did a lot of the work uh, in, this, in this talk. Of course, Alberto Yeo, uh, who was principal, uh, not only as the leader of the group, but also principal in, in, the, in the initiation of this project and all the funding um, uh, that we have received for these projects. So uh, happy to answer any questions. Um, and thank you for, for giving me this time. All right. Thank you very much, Olivia, for a very uh, exciting and inspiring presentation. So the paper is now open for questions. As I say at the beginning, if anybody is interested in posting a questions, um, please use the option of um, raise hand in your screen or just send me a message through the chat option um, stating your name and affiliation, and uh, I will give the floor to um, anyone interested in making questions in a first come first um, serve basis. While we wait for um, the uh, first question, let me just uh, remind everyone that this webinar is being recorded and it will be available for uh, everyone at the um, Cybernet um, YouTube channel uh, or through Cybernet webpage in the um, webinar series uh, section. Um, also, um, I say at the beginning that these uh, webinars are held every other week, which is true, but um, the next one will come in exceptionally next week. So if everyone is interested, please go check the uh, program for the upcoming seminars. And the next one will be uh, next week, not in two weeks. So, um, all right, so any questions? Um, I don't see any uh, raised hands yet or receiving any uh, message through the chat. So let me just break the ice uh, with a very simple question, Olivia. Um, and this is just uh, out of curiosity for VAMP2. Uh, what it is known about the uh, function of this protein? Is there anything known? Yes, so this VAMP2 is vesicular associated membrane protein 2. It's a synaptic brevin, is its other name. It is a snare protein, so it's involved in synaptic vesicle recycling. Um, there is a lot of studies on, on the role of synaptic vesicle recycling in neurodegenerative diseases, um, particularly with alpha synuclein. It is known that it interacts with uh, phosphorylated alpha synuclein and it can even be targeted towards uh, Lewy bodies in alpha in, in, in dementia with Lewy bodies, it can be targeted and sequestered potentially in, in the Lewy body. Uh, there are also studies of other VAMP proteins, VAMP1, uh, which is a, a different protein, that have the same function. They show that it is involved in the secretion. Uh, we published this uh, back in, in 2014. That is, it, it can it is associated with the secretion of A beta 42 and 40 from the neurons. Um, so this is all that is known so far. It's also known to tra uh, transport uh, glutamate receptors. Um, so it may be, it, it's very widely expressed in the brain. So it's across the whole cortex. Um, it's not only at the synapse, as it's a synaptic vesicle recycling. It's always near the uh, synapse, but it's, it's, its function is fundamental for synaptic plasticity. There's also evidence that uh, astrocytes uh, release um, vesicles with a, a VAMP2 in order to control plasticity in the neurons. So um, it, it, it's intriguing to me that uh, a marker that seems to be so ubiquitous in the brain um, showed uh, regional specific changes um, and maybe so related to, to, uh, to Alzheimer's. Um, but it's, it's certainly similar to profiles of other proteins, other snare proteins like SNAP25. So SNAP25 is also a snare protein and is also known in the, in the biomarker field as a promising synaptic biomarker. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's also very intriguing the relationship you have shown with um, um, or the correlation with the P-tau levels. Um, yes. Is that with a particular P tau epitope or with more than one? With, or? with the 181. 181, okay. I mean, it, it strongly correlates with total tau as well. It's just marginally okay. better with a phosphor tau. But. Okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so um, yeah, we have a raised hand here from uh, Teresa Iglesias. Teresa, please go ahead. Hey. 
Yes, hello, Olivia. Hello. Yeah, great talk. Thanks very much for explaining all this. Uh, have you looked for any other uh, modifications like phosphorylations? Because BAMP2 uh, can be also modified by phosphorylation, not only in phosphotau, but maybe other synaptic proteins that you could as well maybe differentiate just by phosphoproteomics uh, or or you just, I mean, it's not that it's not a lot of work. It's just I'm wondering mm -hmm. whether you could uh, as well define some modifications that could be as well bio biomarkers that could be useful. Yeah, that's a, a good point. It's not something we have looked at. Um, when we do the screening in the mass spectrometry, we would, we did not have, uh, we're not able to determine the phosphor, uh, phosphorylation state of these proteins. So uh, this is believed to be the, the total uh, levels. Um, we haven't uh, looked at that, no. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, because knowing that, uh, I mean, of course, we know that uh, tau is hyperphosphorylated in many of these uh, stages, but uh, maybe there are other proteins not yet identified and could be an interest. Maybe other people is doing that anyway. So, oh, great talk. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Teresa and uh, Olivia. So, um, any other questions? No questions coming yet. Um, so let me just make another general question, Olivia. Um, have you tried or do you know whether these um, synaptic proteins you're looking at are also uh, detectable in uh, blood? Um, you know, there is a, there is a trendy um, um, a trend towards using blood-based biomarkers, as you uh, we all know. Yeah. Uh, so I wonder whether this could be detectable in blood as well. Uh, yes, obviously this would be preferential to to CSF. Uh, yes, we know that VAMP2 is detectable in blood, and we do have a working assay that can detect it. And we're about to do a study to see whether it actually has use. Of course, the problem in blood is that you may not be looking at uh, CNS-specific uh, expression, and VAMP2 is not solely expressed in the CNS. So there could be a bit of noise there. Um, what we hope is that it will show at least some correlation with the CSF changes, and that, and that would be very promising if we can get a blood-based biomarker. In terms of other synaptic proteins, um, we have done a proteomic study of, the, of blood, and there are some. Uh, it's much fewer than in the CSF, um, but they're very low, uh, very low expression. So they do need these ultra-sensitive assays uh, to detect them. But uh, there are some promising results that may be coming out in the in the future of of, of plasma or serum biomarkers in, of synaptic proteins. All right, great, thanks. Okay, so um, I insist. Any questions? Don't be shy. I still don't see any raised hands. No messages are getting through the chat. Okay, so let's make a last call for questions. Okay, so then uh, if there are no more questions, um, I think it's time to close the session, but now before thanking Olivia for a very uh, interesting and uh, nice presentation and work. And uh, thank you everyone for attending and remind everyone that the um, webinar um, recording will be available in the next few days through the um, Cybernet uh, YouTube channel or the Cybernet um, web page. And uh, as I also said, uh, the next a uh, webinar will be next week, not in two weeks, by next week. If anyone is interested, please go and look at the program and uh, at the website, CBNet website. All right, so Olivia, again, thank you very much. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much for attending, and uh, you all have a great uh, afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.